Okay. Good evening, good evening everyone. Lovely to see uh, so many people here, here live and uh, welcome back after the Omnitovum. I apologise, by the way, for the, the late notices on the various uh, WhatsApp groups and so on. Uh, still uh, sort of catching back up on the Sukhya on uh, post Um for, for no one's fault, um, we, we've spent quite a long time in the Sukhya, so just in terms of the plan going forward, because of the summer holidays and then Yom Tovim, we sort of ended up getting sort of stuck mid what's quite a, quite a tough and important sugya. Um So my aim is to try and finish off Tiltul Minatad today, um, just by zooming in on, on what I think are the main points I want to focus on and then and then moving on. We then have a, a short two-line sugya that takes us to the Mishnah. Um, and we will spend a bit of time on that in order to get through to the Mishnah, because this is really the first time we've met in a... In a Sort of sort away the very important machlokas, Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi Yehuda. So uh, we'll look at that. And even though there's there's I think no Rashi even on that Gemara, um, nonetheless it's it's quite an important uh, little sugya. And there is a tosis on it on on our daf. And there's also just to remind everyone, effectively a tosis on the sugya back on the Mishnah. So it's a chance to do a bit of Chazara, because the Gemara doesn't really spell it out. It just brings these two opinions of Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Shimon. It doesn't explain how that fits in. So that will be the program for Sunday going forward, and I will give um, Mara Makomas for that. And the aim is to try and get through that little sugya in, in a week or two. It's, it's, it's a two-line sugya, but it, there's a lot to say on it. And then I'm contemplating switching Peyrek to later on in the Masechta, where we will continue with Mukta, but I think from a more um, accessible uh, direction. Um, I'll take a, uh, a lesson from our political leaders to acknowledge mistakes, and um, I think uh, I think that we, we we ended up in the interest of going in order, biting off Mukta from a very hard angle. And uh, I, I hope, uh, having looked at the later sukkas and actually spoken to other Magidei and Rabbanim of Gimel on Mukta, I think we'll we'll jump to um, later on in. Uh, in Masechah Shabbos and, and start, uh, continue Mukta from there. We'll get back one day to our here, but uh, I just think it's been, I certainly have struggled with it. It's, it's, it's been a bit overwhelming starting Mukta this way. Sorry? Seven. We'll start from the 17th period of Shabbos, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's, uh, I, I think that's going to be the plan going forward, but I, I will confirm that. Um, either way, I will be need to send Mara McComas for the short Sugula, little Sugula um, on, uh, that leads to the Mishnah. And uh, today, I just want to focus on on one Nukuda, really, of Tiltul Manatad, just to try and, and tidy up loose ends. Um, I did touch on this before in the very short amount of learning that we had between the summer holidays and Yomim Naroim. So this is partially a revision, and forgive me for that, and, and hopefully also a little bit new and tidying loose ends up. So it, it, basically, the, the, the core focus of what we're going to look at is that the Gemara at the bottom of Mengimel Amud Beis um, it brings a machlokus about whether tiltul minatzad, shmei tiltul, or lav shmei tiltul. And Tosfus, um, and all the Rishonim, really, um, do, what they, do what they often do, which is they, they draw from our Gemara, from the default... Every Gemara is structured with um, um, bringing various sources, whether these are Mishnayos or Brysus or statements of the Amorayim, which is Al Gemara, it brings statements from Amorayim. And then the anonymous structure of the Gemara discusses and debates these sources, which is what we call Stoma de Gemara. And it's clear from the Stoma of the Gemara that it favors the Tzad that Tiltul Manar Tzad Shmei Tiltul, because it, it sort of aligns itself with, no, let's learn that Kula Alma, everyone holds, Tiltul Manar Tzad Shmei Tiltul. The anonymous voice of the Gemara, when it hashpins out the maths of the Sukya, prefers that Tzad, which Tosus adopts as a rule to be saying that that's how the Gemara Paskins. Um, Tosas then asks the contradiction because we see many other Gemaras which say that Tultul Manatad loves Shmei Tultul. So we're left effectively with a contradiction in the Moskana of the Gemara whether Tultul Manatad is or isn't Tultul. Um, Tosas' uh, answer is that Tultul Manatad is Tultul as per our Gemara, but that's where you are doing Tultul Manatad in order to move the Mukta. So it's true that I am physically and tangibly moving the beds, for example. But my intention is to move the mace. So it's true that I'm doing so indirectly, but nonetheless, I'm doing that for the Torah Dovah Asu. And that's Tiltul and Atad, Shmei Tiltul. It doesn't matter that I'm doing it via uh, something else, but my intention is to move the, uh, the Asu object. 
as opposed to the other Gemaras, where my intention is not to move the Asa object, the Muksa object, my intention is to do it for the Torah of Dovah Musa, and it just so happens that something Muksa is getting moved in the process. So my intention is to pull out the vegetable, uh, the vegetable, but it happens to be the earth is shaken off, and my intention is to move the bed, but it happens to be that there's uh, something on the bed that gets moved, and uh, therefore the Muksa thing gets moved uh, as an as a side, but my intention, in brief, this enters halachic literature as total man atzad l'tzorech dava hamuta is muta, total man atzad l'tzorech dava asa is asa. That's the bottom line of the conclusion. And uh, I know that I'm, I'm not going to focus now on the Shulchan Aruch and the Mishnah Bura because of the interest of time. But the truth is, all, all, the main thing to draw out, there were, there were other reasons why I printed the Mishnah Bura and Shulchan Aruch and so because they're interesting sources. But the core thing to bring out is this is what ends up as halach and amaisa, that total man atzad is allowed when it's a surah of our mutter and not allowed for surah of also. So, so basically, just in terms of practical halacha, and we will we'll get back to this again and again and again as we redo, as we continue mukta. In terms of practical halacha, whenever you need to move something upon which mukta is positioned, you need to ask yourself a number of questions. You first need to ask yourself, is it a bosses? In other words, if mukta, if if object A, which is mukta, sits on top of object B, it may be that object B has caught the mukta, has become mukta itself, because of the concept of bosses of it being uh, uh, submerged to the identity of the muksa item, and so they're serving the muksa item as, as a basis, as a bosses, as a, as a platform for it, and therefore it itself has become muksa. So that's the first question you have to ask yourself, is it bosses? Is the under object, has the under object become muksa in its own right because of the halacha of bosses? If the under object hasn't become muksa in its own right, I now need to ask myself, okay, but I'm still moving the muksa indirectly, that's tiltal minatad. Is tiltal minatad allowed or not? So I now need to ask myself two further questions. Number one, am I doing this the Tzorich Dov HaMuta, or am I doing it the Tzorich Dov HaAsa? If it's the Tzorich Dov HaMuta, then it would be allowed. If it's Tzorich Dov HaAsa, it's not allowed. And number two, is there a workaround which is called Nior? And again, uh, that's what I wanted to bring out from the Shulchan Aruch and the Mishnah and the Rishonim reference this a little bit, which is, if I can shake off the Muksa object, rather than directly moving it, then that minimizes the Issa, and therefore that's the appropriate thing for me to do. So that's the sort of uh, flowchart that we always need to follow in terms of practical halacha. What um, I wanted to focus though on is wh why is there this chiluk? In other words, if tiltul min hatzad is allowed, no, I mean, make up your mind. If tiltul min hatzad is allowed, then it should be allowed, no, irrespective of my intention in moving the object. If tiltul min hatzad is not allowed, then it shouldn't be allowed, irrespective of my intention. Now, let's make up your mind. Is tiltul min hatzad called moving muksa, in which case it should never be allowed, or is it called not moving muksa, in which case it should always be allowed? Why does it make a difference if I'm doing it the Torah Dava Mutter or the Torah Dava Asa? And why is Neor shaking off relevant over here? In other words, in a sense, what we're going to bring out here is a continuation of, of everything we've learned this Perek, which is we come into the Sukkot of Mukta living in a very black and white world. It's all or nothing. It's on or off. And we, we, we grew to learn over this Perek, despite us struggling through this, we grew to learn that muksa should be thought of as, as linking to, mul to the, the functionality of Kaden. It's not on-off. Something can be muksa with respect to one functionality and also with respect to another functionality. You're going to have something which is allowed to be moved, but you're not allowed to benefit from it. Um, it, it we should think of muksa as attaching itself to the various uh, functionalities and roles and so on. And then for this, this sukkah is just another example of forcing us to think uh, in a more nuanced manner about uh, muksa. So the first svara that um, we considered with respect to this question is, is in, in Lomdus, in, in, in svara, it's a very beautiful svara, um, but the Rishonim at least don't seem to go with it, despite the beauty of the svara. First svara is a very nice svara. The Lomdus, the logic of Tiltum and Atad, is I'm not directly engaging with a Mukta, I'm only indirectly engaging with a Mukta. If we think of Mukta as engagement, a Mukta is not just touch or movement or something like that, it's engaging with a Mukta item. So tilton and atad is a, a more indirect form of engagement. I'm not directly with engaging with it. So if I'm doing tilton and atad, where I'm moving object A in order to move object B, i.e. the Torah Dava Asa, then that's a direct engagement with the Dava Asa, albeit through something else. And therefore that wouldn't that would not be allowed. If on the other hand, I'm moving object A, the, the, the mutter object, and the object of the mukta is incidental, I have no interest in it, I'm neither engaging with it physically, because I'm not physically moving it, I'm moving it indirectly, nor am I engaging with it conceptually because I, I, my, my target of my movement is not the Osa object. On the contrary, it's just getting in the way. I want to rid myself of it. And therefore, it should be allowed, uh, and therefore it's allowed to move. So, so really, the logic of Tiltul and Atat is, am I directly engaging with the Mukta item or not? What defines directly or indirectly engaging is, is if it's Minatad that I'm not directly moving it, 
and my intentionality is not targeted to the mukta item, then it should be allowed, otherwise it'd be utter. And, and as I mentioned last time, this, this fits very beautifully the language of the Gemara, really. Tiltul minatav, movement minatav, shmei tiltul, it's called a tiltul, its name is tiltul, it's defined as a tiltul, or no shmei tiltul, it's not defined as a tiltul. In other words, is this a tiltul? Is this a, a, uh, an engagement with, with, a, with an object or not? Incidentally, by the way, the word tiltul, which we translate loosely as movement, may actually be more accurately translated as taking. Whenever I engage with an object, whenever I move an object, I'm taking the object. I mean, we say on the tilas lulav, for example, just we've just come out of Yom Tov, on the tilas lulav. On the tilas lulav is, is the bracha said in the midst of the kachta nochem, take for yourself the Arba Minim. So the Tilas Lulav is, is a taking of the Lulav. Tiltul is, is an Atila, is, is, it's not just a movement, it's an engagement with, is, is a better translation. And therefore, is Tiltul in itself called an engagement or not? That's the Machlokas um, in uh, Amoroyim in our Sugya. And the halachic conclusion is, well, it depends. Tiltul and Shmei Tiltul, it could be a direct engagement, but it would depend whether your intentionality is to move the object or not. That there would be a, a nice sort of Svara and and a reasonable explanation in the uh, in the Gemara. So this is um, this is this is one attempt, and and, and uh, it, it's 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 got a lot going for it in terms of the svara, and and many posts can take this as the the uh, the explanation. Um, the second model is 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 a, a more mechanical model, which is that tiltul min hatzad is a a weaker form of engagement. It is an engagement with the object. It's just a weaker form of engagement with the mukta, and therefore Chazal were prepared to give it more allowances. And therefore, for the needs of Shabbos, or and where there's no other solution, are you near or casting it off doesn't work? They allowed tiltul minatad. So the second model is is it doesn't have the same beauty of sort of svara over here, but but what it forces us to to sort of think about is that there's degrees of engagement with mux items. Direct engagement, I'm taking something in my hands, always offer. Indirect engagement, I'm moving indirectly. They allowed the Torah Shabbos um, where necessary, and therefore that's why they said if you can do knee or if you can shake it off, it shouldn't uh, be allowed because it's a heta. And as really, I am, and, and Tiltul and Asad, the real conclusion of the Gemara in this model is Tiltul and Asad is, is a sort of Tiltul. It's a weaker form of engagement. And therefore, the debate is whether Hitiru, whether they allowed it um, uh, uh, or not. And the conclusion of, of, of the Chiluk of, that Tosis comes out with is they allowed it where there's a need and they didn't allow it where there's no Torah Shabbos. And therefore, it's allowed the Torah of Hamutta and not allowed the Torah of Ha'asa. That's the second uh, model of understanding the. The sugya. And this model I, I mentioned last time, I mentioned both models last time, I just wanted to uh, look at this inside very briefly in the, in the sources because I, I don't think we, we got up to that. And um, this model is really, it, I have to tell you, I only printed a sample of the sources, but many many of the Rishonim use this language, one of them whom is in source 8, the Ritva on our sugya. Um, the, fir the first part of the Ritva really is, is like Tosas, he basically asks the contradiction between the sugyas. And then he says in the, in the third paragraph in the Ritva on source eight on page three, he says, Vyesha Tarit, that one can answer the loads on You shouldn't compare our sugya, which says Tiltul Minatat is not allowed, and the, the other sugyas, which says Tiltul Minatat is allowed. Um, the Hocha, Lutzorach Dovha also. Here we're talking about moving something to something that's forbidden. Could go mace, such as a dead body. Tiltul Minatat, Shmei Tiltul Asa. In that case, Tiltul Minatat is Tiltul Minatat. Kulu all these other scenarios where you are um, uh, um, trying to draw um, something out of the, the coals, or you're trying to uh, money which is on the pillow and you want to shake off the, the pillow in order that the money should fall, or you've got straw on a bed, all these other cases. Avukulu Idach, all the other cases, Domimun the Alma, where we talk about in other cases and other sugars, have a Surah Dava Hamutta, that's for the sake of something Mutta, or the Surah Shabbos. And for the sake of Shabbos, so the fikr chitiru bo tiltul min hatzad, and therefore they allowed it for the sake of tiltul min hatzad. So the language of the ritva is is clear that he he conceptualizes this not like the first way we explained, but the second way that we explained. What he doesn't just say it's a surah dava hamutza and therefore it's allowed. He says a surah dava hamutza, therefore it's surah Shabbos. It's for Shabbos needs, and therefore hitiru. Therefore they allowed it. Hitiru. Who are the they who allowed it? Rabbanon allowed it. Because he's not saying that the internal logic of Mukta says that this should be allowed because it's an indirect engagement. It's an exemption clause. They, they, they waived the prohibition of movement of Mukta because it's a weaker total where there's a Torah of, uh, of Shabbos. So it's clear to me that the, the, the Ritva takes a, 
different model. The Ritzel takes the model of it's an allowance where there's a Torah at Shabbos, and, and that seems to me clearly the intention of the of the Ritzel. I didn't print this, but um, the Ritzel in uh, later on in the Masechta, he, he actually said a very similar language to Ritzel. I just didn't print it because it was off the sugya. He says he, he says almost word to word the same as it. He says it's an out of Torah Onik Shabbos. He throws in the word Onik Shabbos. Now it's, it's again emphasizing this point. Tiltum of the Matzad Shemay Tiltum is the Maskon of our Gemara. It is a Tiltum. But don't think it's as big a tool as a regular direct contact. It's a weaker form of engagement, and therefore they built an allowance into it. That's the, the Ritzel's uh, conclusion. So the Mandama who says loish may tiltal holds it's completely allowed, nothing to worry about because it's not a tiltal at all. The Mandama Shmei tiltal says it is a tiltal, but they raise it because it's a weaker form of tiltal where you have no get out option like Nior and where it's for the sake of Shabbos. That's the, the Ritzel's uh, uh, conclusion, and that's how the Ritzel learns. And, and other Rishonim, sorry, Adam. Yeah. So th this is good. Last time I mentioned I was troubled by the, this language. Upon reflection, I'm no longer troubled by it because both sentences are true. The mm -hmm. Manzama who says Lo Shemay Tiltal means it's never called a Tiltal, nothing to talk about. The Manzama who says Shemay Tiltal says it's somewhat of a Tiltal, but it's not a full Tiltal. And therefore, where there's a Torah Shabbos, it's allowed because at the end of the day, it's not a full tiltal. Where, no where there's no where there's no Torah Shabbos, it isn't allowed because Shmei tiltal because it has some degree of tiltal to it. And also, what 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 what, um, what what percolated over the break between the last time we spoke about it and this time we spoke about it is I'm being too black and white about what, about tiltal. It's a degree of tiltal. Tiltal comes in shades, and it's a degree of tiltal. It's not a full tiltal, and therefore it's lo shmei tiltal. It's allowed with the Surah Shabbos. But it's somewhat of a tiltal, therefore shmei tiltal. Amman Dama calls it shmei tiltal, and he doesn't allow it uh, completely. And, and we have to do it for We have to get used to nuance and, and uh, in, in what we mean by by uh, by tiltal. So uh, I think that's the um, that's the Ritzvah's uh, model. Um, the final source I mentioned on this was the Ur Zerua. Um, the Azra is not written, I'll say that off. It's a, it's a, a, a halachic work from uh, a Russian who, um, who who came from uh, Vienna in Austria. Um, I didn't find it myself, but it was referenced by the Achonim, and he speaks about this halacha. Um, let's have a quick read of this inside. Um, and certainly I'll just tell you a quick story about the Azra if we're, uh, if, we're, um, if we're talking about this. Um, I was at a, I was, I was, uh, officiated at a wedding yesterday, and the Chosen's second name was Akiva. How is Akiva spelt? Is it spelt Ein Kufiud base Aleph or base A at the end of the word? So you may ask what on earth this has to do with the Azura. So uh, the Azura, this is a fascinating story. The Azura was, so how you spell names in Halacha is very important because particularly for a get, a name has to be spelled accurately, it has to contain the full concept, a name has to be spelled accurately. So the Azura was puzzling over this question. Um, is Akiva, is it meant, by the way, in printed in our Gemara, in our version of the Gemara, it's always spelled with an Aleph at the end. Um, and the other was, was pondering this matter and came to the conclusion that it was spelt with a hey, the halakhic conclusion that Akiva should spell it with a hey. And that night, his name wasn't the Azura, by the way, I mean, he called it safe Azura. And the reason he called it as far as that night he had a dream. And in the dream, he dreamt the, the posuk that we say on Kol Nidre. This is what I think about every year on Kol Nidre. Azura, the Tzadik, or the Yishra Lev Simcha. And the Sofei Tevas, the end, so, so the Azura was, why on earth did he dream this posuk? Now, the last letters of Azura, the Tzadik, the Simcha is a Reish, which stands for Rabbi. And then Ayan Kuf Yud Base Hey, Akiva spelled with a Hey, Ur Zerua, with an Ayan Zerua, the Tzadik, or the Yishrei, Leiv Simcha. So it's Akiva spelled with a Hey. So he, he found this a wonderful dream and he took it as a, a seal of approval. I spoke in my Shabbat Shiva Josh about dreams and uh, mysticism and Kabbalah and its place in Halacha. So the Zerua uh, um, uh, found this dream as a, a sort of encouraging support from Shemayim that he was correct in Paskin that Akiva. Should be spelt with a hey, which is indeed the way I spelt it from the Kusufa yesterday. And in memory of the story, he named his safer Azura. So uh, that's why the safer is called Azura. So that's uh, apropos for learning the, the Azura. Um, it, it depends on, on if the person's got used to spelling it with an aleph or not. Um, some people are going to the habit of spelling an aleph, in which case, yes. Um, but if someone hasn't got into the habit of spelling it, um, in the case of this particular Baal Simcha, he hasn't got into the habit of spelling it anyway because uh, he had adopted the name fairly recently as a as a Gerard Tzedek, and therefore uh, his name was spelled accurately. So it was a fairly, uh, it was an unusual server that we managed to spell the name with a hey and, uh, um, and uh, followed the suck of the, uh, the Azura. Okay, so that's a, a little story about the Azura. We're now learning that Azura has nothing to do with Gittin and nothing to do with uh, how to spell the name uh, Akiva. 
Um, and the Azrael says as follows. Um, he says, he's really bothered by the same stew, the same contradiction. And he answers, let's just have a look at this in Source 9 on the bottom of the The height of Boskin and Hulchus are Karav, Betiltel, and Atzach, Betiltel. How many Dafka, Bemesa, Kyoto, Boy? It's given just Sorich, Lotus, Dov, and Metaltel. Since you need the thing that you're moving, or the Gavana, Metaltel, and you're moving it for that reason, the Ikil, Tultul, Lotus, Dov, and your main intention is for that Osa thing, Ha Osa, Betiltel, this Muksa thing, Sovera, Blahachme, Dilma, Osa, Betiltel, is to the Gamma, Bio, Dime, Ravas, Machme, in case you come to move the Muksa directly. So the Azra is the third model of why there's a chiluk between um, Tiltul and Hatzad for the sake of something that's Muqsa, not for the sake of something that's Muqsa. He says, if you do Tiltul and Hatzad, the Tzorech Dov HaMuqsa, fine. You're indirectly moving it. Indirect movement is allowed. If you're doing Tiltul and Hatzad, the Tzorech Dov HaMuqsa, you're doing indirect movement, so it should be allowed. But we're worried that you'll come to move Muqsa, and therefore it's forbidden. So his uh, stance is that in truth, Tiltul and Hatzad, Loishmi Tiltul, it is not a movement. It is not considered Tiltul. Period. But since uh, you, you are, after all, engaging somewhat with a mukta item, and your whole focus is for the sake of the mukta item, therefore you may come to move it, and therefore they uttered it. So he would tell, translate tiltul and atachme tiltul as even though conceptually it's not a tiltul, the fact is you are moving the mukta item, and you're doing that with intentionality. We're worried that you will come and uh, end up moving the mukta, uh, the mukta item. So this is the uh, um, this is the view of the uh, of the uh, of the Azura. Um, I just want to then spend a couple of minutes learning the riff uh, together. Um, so, so, so just to summarize, sorry, is, is this clear? So we have a, a Svara, which is that Tiltul Manatad is called engagement with Muksa when you're doing it for the sake of Muksa, and not engagement with Muksa when you're doing it for the sake of something which is Muta. We have a Ritva who says that Tiltul Manatad is a weaker form of Tiltul, which they waived when it's for Dr. For Shabbos, and we have Azura, which has Tiltul and Atad is not Tiltul at all, but they, they forbade Tiltul and Atad when you're doing it for the sake of Muksa in case you come and move the Muksa. The riff is, is very mysterious. Um, the riff again asks all these questions, and it, I, I really struggled. I, I wasn't even entirely sure um, how to translate the riff exactly and, and what the riff was talking about until I saw that the Rishonim also struggled. Um, and, and the riff says uh, as follows. Um, He says, uh, uh, this is the third line in the second paragraph of the riff. The riff is on page two, source four. There's two paragraphs in the way I printed the riff. And he says as follows. So he asks the same contradictions as Tosas. And he answers, Honey, Mili could go in our of Yotzebahem. This Issa is with stones and the like. The Inun of Torah Shabbos, the Oster the Teltel, Mimakon Rakon, Dumir Demes. These are stones and a dead body, which are useless for Shabbos. And you're not allowed to move them. Um, because they have no use for Shabbos, they're Muqsa. Because Amun Hassan ben Shemayin, Chai Harika, Evan, Vasa, Vital, Tzadu, Dukum, Eistami, etc. Aval Pagos, Shatom, Nob, Teven. Yeah, sorry. Hanu Mili, Kukun, Avonu, sorry. Okay, sorry, yes. So, so it, it, the, it, it, the, a, a child born prematurely, such that we are convinced the child will not live, is Muqsa, like a mace, because the child has no future life, and therefore, it isn't allowed to be moved. So all the riff is bringing from that is that a, a dead a, a dead body is um, is mukta. Now in halacha, this is called a ben shmona because a ben shmona was a premature child who, in the times of Chazal, couldn't live, and therefore, such a premature child is is choshev kameis. And all the riff is drawing out from that is that a, a dead body is mukta, as we see. But ben shmona, even though the ben shmona happens to be living, is is not going to live and therefore is Ke'evan as the, the, the most strict halachic state of Muqsa. But Otsal and Saltalo, and therefore it's also not allowed to move. The Kameh Stomi, because it is like a dug body. Whereas the other cases where I want to have food, but the food is surrounded by dust or by um, uh, uh, silage and the like. To Eichlin hein their food, but Tzorich la Eichlin Meshabbos, and you need to eat them on Shabbos. Tiltul and Atzad. Um, this type of Tiltul and Atzad, the Cholki Hai Milsa Loishmei Tiltul is not called Tiltul. So I, I honestly have to say the riff is untranslatable. It's 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 impossible. It's very very hard to understand what the riff is saying. The riff says as follows. He says Even a stone and a dead body is completely mukta and it has no Shabbos use. Therefore, you're not allowed to move it. Whereas the case where I'm trying to get to the food. I want the food, and it happens to be that you've got muksa in the way, therefore uh, that's tiltum and atad, and therefore it's allowed. 
so I, I didn't know what to do with this ritva. Uh, I really couldn't. Uh, I couldn't translate it until I saw that the Rashba um, really brings the ritva and struggles with. Uh, sorry, ritva. Sorry, I struggled with this riff. I didn't know what to do with this riff. I couldn't translate this riff. I didn't understand his distinction until I saw the Rashba brings the riff and himself is puzzled as to what the riff means. And he gives two theories as to what the riff means. The first theory is that the mace, the mace or the even is an independent entity with a full mukta, mukta status. And therefore it's true that I'm moving something which isn't mukta, but in so doing, I'm also moving something which is just an independent, unrelated object, which is mukta. And therefore my action is, is as much an engagement with the non-mukta as with the mukta. And therefore, even though it's indirect, and nonetheless, I'm, I'm moving the mukta item and it should be forbidden. Whereas in the case of the vegetable, which is surrounded by earth or whatever it may be, it, it's packed into earth. It's packed into silage. And the, the, the silage with earth on it is just scattered dust and particles on it of no real significance. Therefore, my action is considered as an action in a non mukta item, and I can view the mukta as being completely independent and, sorry, completely irrelevant and of no halachic engagement. That's how, with difficulty, he reads the, the riff. And it's not that clear in the riff that that's what the riff is saying, but that is his first suggestion in the riff. He then says he doesn't like it, it doesn't work. Because that doesn't answer the case of the mitzvah with the kush on it, in which the saw has the sawdust, the, the straw, sorry, has no relationship to the bed. And these are two independent objects. The kush is useful. I mean, animals eat straw. It's not just, you know, a bit of uh, dust scattered on a vegetable. It's, it's you've got the straw on the bed. Straw, it could be used for bedding and the like. It's got its own significance. And therefore, he says, I don't think this is, a, I don't understand that this is rough, what the riff means. And then his fallback position is, is he says, maybe the riff me, really means like all the, all the other is showing him. And it depends on intentionality. If your intentionality is to move the uh, the mukta, then it's so dava asa. And if your intentionality is to move the uh, um, the non mukta item, then it's uh, then it's um, uh, then it's not dava. Then then it's mutta. If that's the reason of the riff, then again the riff is saying again the same svara because again he mentions this language of inun l'sorich shabbos. He says the ochlin heim l'sorich l'ochlin shabbos. They're food and you need to eat them for shabbos. And therefore the riff is saying the same svara that uh, we waive this weaker form of engagement for the sake of the needs of Shabbos. Okay, so just to summarize, we have a riff which is very unclear. Ha have, you haven't had a chance, have a look at source four, see if you can work out what the riff is saying. Um, the the Rashba gives two theories as to what the riff means. The first theory is that a dead body or Evan is an independent entity. And therefore, who says I'm engaging with one more than others? It's true, I'm moving the mutter item, but I'm also moving the otter item. What would allow that? Whereas in the second case, I'm moving the mutter item and it just happens to me, it's got to be of dirt. I need to shake off that something incidental. The Rashba says he doesn't understand that. Then he says the second sorrow that really the riff means like Tosis and everyone else. It depends whether you're moving tilted on that other sort of us or sort of our mutter. And uh, um, and if that's the reason of the riff, I simply want to point out that the riff joins the family of Rishonim who say that the Svara is um, Sorech Shabbos because the riff explicitly says you're moving this to Sorech Shabbos and therefore that should be enough to um, allow it. Um, I just want to spend, and, and forgive me, I, I'm going to go, I try not to, I'm going to go two minutes over time if that's okay. Um, I just want to mention some distinctions between these different reasons and, and just work out the maths of this. Again, these distinctions are not my own idea on Shabbos. I wish I knew Mesach Shabbos as well as that. I, I just collated from various achronim uh, what I thought were fascinating uh, debates linked to this. Um, so one discussion is, am I allowed to move on Shabbos a, a lantern where I want to move the light in order to have the light elsewhere? I want to use the light. Now, a flame is mukta. We're not going to go into why, but flame is mukta. Normally a lantern is a bosses, but this is a story where the lantern is not a bosses. So can I move it with tiltul min hatzad? So let's hashman out. Normally you can't move a non-mukta item for the sake of the mukta item. But am I moving it here for the sake of the mukta item? Well, if I'm moving it because I I want to protect the lantern, or I don't want the flame in here, I want it somewhere else. I'm moving it for the sake of the mukta item. But I'm not moving it for the sake of mukta item, I'm using it for the, moving it for the sake of light. Light is a perfectly mutta Shabbos use. And therefore, um, the, there are resho there are poskim who argue that this would be allowed, because I'm moving it for the sake of, uh, of Dava Hamutta. Now, let's hash me out according to each reason in the Rishonim, whether this forum makes sense. So if the um, logic is 
like the Urza Roar that I'm worried that you're going to engage with the Mukta, this will definitely be Utter. I'm moving it in order to have the light in another room. I'm engaging with the, um, the Mukta. If the reason is because of Torah Shabbos, Shabbos needs, then this makes sense. I'm doing it for the needs of Shabbos. A light is a perfectly permissible Shabbos need. If the story is that I'm not engaging with the Mukta item, I am engaging with the Mukta item because it's the flame that I want in the other room in order to get the light from the flame. So, so just to summarize, I, I found this a fascinating uh, halachic debate. Um, I've got a, I'm doing tiltul minatsad, again, tiltul minatsad on a lantern or a candle in a case where there's no bosses. If I'm doing it because I, don't, I want uh, to protect the lantern from getting damaged, so that is a classic case of Tilton and Atad, the Torah Dava Osa, definitely not an out. But what happens if I'm doing it because I want the flame, I want the light elsewhere, I want a light in another room. Tilton and Atad for the sake of a light. So if the logic is that Tilton and Atad is only allowed when I'm not engaging with the Mukta item, I'm engaging with the flame. That's why I'm moving it, because I want the flame in another room. However, if the logic is that for Tzorich Shabbos it's allowed, I'm not doing it for the Tzorich of the Dava Osa, the lantern. I'm doing it for the Tzorich of Dava Mutta. I want to use this room in a light manner. And therefore, this should be, it should be allowed. And I have to tell you, this is discussed extensively by the postkin. It's discussed in the case of straw on the bed. What happens if I want to sleep on the straw? Is that called Tzorich Dava Mutzah or Tzorich Dava Asa? And this is, uh, um, this is a debate that's discussed extensively in the postkin. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here simply because we've run out of time. But I, just, I want to put that to your, to your uh, if you have spare time, to ponder this matter. Very, very interesting. When I'm moving something for the sake of Tiltum and Atad, and by the way, this is halacha l'maisa, absolutely practical halacha l'maisa. I was asked um, 10 times before sukkahs about moving uh, lights and from the sukkah and heaters from the sukkah and in and out with the rain and so on and so forth. And this comes down to a, a real practical halacha l'maisa questions. If, if, if we're talking about filaments and if we consider this to have the same status as an air as to whether tilton and atad is a solution when I want it inside or, or uh, when I don't want it inside. In brief, if I want the heater or the light inside, would Tiltal bin Atad be enough to, to make all of this? Very, very important uh, halakhic ramification. And it depends on how we, uh, how we conceptualize Tiltal bin Atad. If the logic of Tiltal bin Atad is that I'm not engaging with the Mukta item, I am engaging with the Mukta item. I'm engaging with the Nair, of course I am. If the logic of Tiltal bin Atad that's allowed is because of a Hetzer Tzorach, this is a Hetzer Tzorach. Using a room with an item is a Hetzer Tzorach. There's no Issa of using a room with an item. It's true, I'm moving a Mukta object, but I'm doing it in order to have a Hetzer Tzorach. So it's Shabbos, and therefore the Tiltal and Atzad would be allowed in this place. We're going to stop Tiltal and Atzad with this, and in Hashem Sunday, we're going to start the short sukkah of, uh, of Rabbi Shimon Rabbi Yoda, which again is a very cool Mukta, mukta sukkah. So, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you.